Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Your Mark on the World show. I'm your host, Devin Thorpe. I'm a Forbes contributor covering social entrepreneurship and impact investing. And our guest today brings some very hopeful news for really for the world. But uh, our guest today is Jill O'Donnell Tormy, and she is the CEO of the Cancer Research Institute. Uh, Jill, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much, Devin. I'm really happy to be here. Well, I think we are happier to have you than you are to be here. We appreciate you taking the time. But I think what is most intriguing about the research you're funding these days is that you, in our preliminary material, you used the word cure to talk about some of the uh, therapies that seem to be coming online now and that is a pretty radical word for a cancer researcher. Tell us a little bit about why you use that word. Well certainly I, and you're right it is a radical word which I have basically not used in almost my 30 years of being here at the Cancer Research Institute but the recent results that we're seeing with immunotherapies which is uh, treatments that really teach your immune system how to uh, better respond to cancer, that, that it's just really giving a hint that I think we could potentially cure all cancers with immunotherapy. And that is a false state. We're not there yet. I want people to think that we, we're, we're curing everything now. But I think with more research, which is what is really the important thing, from the basic laboratory research through to the clinic, uh, I think we're going to see more and more of these cure-like responses that we're seeing now in melanoma uh, happening in other cancers. And I think that's extremely exciting. It's extremely gives a lot of hope to people. And it's uh, it's basically using the uh, innate ability of the immune uh, that allows these really durable and specific responses that are giving all of the, I think, the entire medical community uh, hope. Well, why is cancer such, from a scientific standpoint, from a cure standpoint, why is it so difficult? Well, I think first off, you know, it's not a single disease. You know, cancer is a, a name that's given to hundreds of diseases. So there isn't just a, you know, one thing fits all, I would say. And it's also extremely complicated. Uh, you know, cancer cells are dynamic and they change and they mutate and they can become unresponsive to initial treatments and they find escape mechanisms. And so I think it really comes down to that it's taken us this time due to understanding cellular biology, molecular biology, genetics, in terms of really understanding what is cancer, how it develops, and then I and I think all our area that the Cancer Research Institute has really been the leader in for 60 years is understanding also the immune system. We all know that we have an immune system that uh, actually works and protects us against, you know, uh, bacteria and viruses. And in the same way it does that, it has that innate capability to do this with cancer. But cancer is very much uh, uh, as I said, dynamic, and so it has escape mechanisms, and it's only through a really understanding of this interaction of the immune system and cancer that we really understand that cancer actually has ways to turn off the immune system. So it is these new things that are called checkpoint blockades that are actually allowing the immune response, which is there against a cancer, to actually continue unchecked and stop the, the, the escape mechanisms that the cancer has. And it is in this area that we've seen such dramatic results in the last few years. Give us some of blockades. <clears throat> I was just going to ask you if you could give us some specific examples of some of the new drugs that are taking advantage of these new checkpoint uh, technologies. Yeah, so from a, from a scientific side, these things are, are antibodies, they form with under the name of Eurovoy, and more recently in the last year there's something called anti-PD-1 which is actually two separate drugs have been approved by the FDA one that's called Keytruda and one that's called so these are what I think the consumer the person the cancer patients will hear these and these are now FDA approved treatments they're checkpoint blockades but they're really only for 
advanced melanoma patients that have failed other treatments. So this is, as I said, it's the beginning. You're at the, the tip of the iceberg, combination or alone, are really yielding some remarkable results in metastatic melanoma, which 10 years ago there was really no treatments at all. And now we're seeing patients live decades after being treated with these checkpoint blockades. And it is not only in melanoma, even though that's where the FDA has approved these drugs, is ongoing research supported by the Cancer Research Institute and many others in terms of hundreds of clinical trials going on, really testing these in combination with standard treatments, in combinations with other immunotherapies, and in a variety of cancer types. So I think coming down in the next decade, as these results of these clinical trials become mature and we see, we're going to see these and other cancers for uh, other diseases, you know, other cancers besides melanoma. This is so exciting it, to, to think about finally getting on top of the disease at a fundamental level that may have application across so many different forms of the disease. So <clears throat> let's look at, you, you say that the drug has been approved for and there have been good outcomes with uh, some cases of melanoma. Let's be as specific as we can. What are we seeing in those patients for whom this is working now in, with, with melanomas, advanced melanomas? Well, I think with the, with the first drug I talked about, the anti-CTLA-4, which is Yorgoid, this has been out on the market and approved longer and actually was the first checkpoint that was approved and tested. So we have more data here. So we have decade-long results here. And we are, we have patients that were basically with melanoma, had tried every treatment available 10 years ago, and were basically facing death, unfortunately, went into one of these first clinical trials of anti cdla 4 and now are well and alive a decade later. With the other two anti-PD-1 drugs, they've only been in development a shorter period of time, and we really only have data that are maybe two to three years out, but we are seeing these durable responses. These are not like some of the other treatments that have come along, some of the targeted therapies that people, you get this a rem remarkable response quickly, but maybe in three to four months there's, there are recurrence. They, the patient stops responding. With these immunotherapies, and I, it's really based on, you remember, your immune system has memory. I think we all know that we get ch vaccinated for childhood diseases like measles, and you have a lifelong protection, because if you're exposed to that agent again, your immune system jump starts and gets rid of it before you, you get sick. So it is this innate ability of the immune system to have this memory that is leading to these, uh, I think, these dramatic and durable responses. And I think this is one thing that is so exciting. This is these are not results that are only three months and then and then you have you know uh, you stop responding to the treatment. These treatments seem to have uh, legs, and it, that's what I think really makes it extremely exciting. Yeah. Well, let's now look forward just a little bit. Uh, you, you suggested that the Drugs will have application for a broader range of cancers. Uh, give us some sense of the timeline for new drugs, for new approvals for existing drugs. Uh, give us some sense of what the path is from here and whether you think that this really has the potential to cure all cancers, and if so, on what kind of timeline that might look like. Well, I think right now in clinical trial, and some of these early clinical trials, the results have been out. It's not yet at the approval stage, but I think some of these drugs are being fast-tracked by the FDA for approval. And we are actually seeing similar responses, uh, at least in the subs. And again, this is not 100% of patients respond this way, and that's why I want to really bring it down to reality, and that this is why more research is needed. But say, say take non-small cell lung cancer, which is one of the big cancers that everything wor worries about. I think other people, when you had responses in melanoma, there was always a feeling, well, melanoma was one of those cancer types that may maybe were immunologically, you know, uh, uh, reactive. But non-small cell cancer, cell non-small cell lung cancer was really not considered a cancer that could be treated by immunotherapy a decade ago. And we are seeing some of these responses, these durable responses in the subset of patients in stuff like non-small cell lung cancer, in head and neck cancer, in prostate cancer, in bladder cancer, in kidney cancer. So, I mean, this is all, again, at this point, it's a little bit anecdotal because we're, we're not there at the statistical significance and the length of study that would allow the FDA to approve, but these are all very positive signals. And I can tell you, having been in this field for so long with the Cancer Research Institute and being an organization 
that was at some time the only organization funding can fundamental cancer immunology, believing that the immune system could be used as a treatment for cancer. We're now seeing the medical community, doc, you know, frontline, you know, doctors and oncologists really standing up and taking notice and realizing that immunotherapy is going to is here to stay and it's going to become part of the standard arsenal for the treatments of many cancers. As I said, this is not happening tomorrow. And I think we have to still understand that not all cancer patients are responding, even when we're seeing these miraculous long-term remissions and, and responses to this, it's not 100% of patients are responding. So we need to continue funding research. I mean, that's a message I really want to get across. We need to support organizations like the Cancer Research Institute that supports cancer immunology research from the lab to the clinic so that we can continue to understand why some patients respond and why some don't. And this is, a, is an amazing opportunity that we've never had before. So because in this field we never had a cohort of patients that responded. But now we do. And so when people are in clinical trials, you can get their blood, you can get their tissue samples. We can start analyzing with all the tools of molecular biology and genetics and bio, you know, bioinformation into turn on really trying to understand why did this patient respond here? even though they had the same disease versus this one. And this comes down to maybe a little bit personalized or understanding what are the issues of how we can make a non-responder become a responder. Because it, it tells you the immunotherapy can do this. When the immune, when it works right, you get remarkable responses. We need to continue doing research so it can work right in more cancer patients. And we need to understand how to do that. And that's where the hope is there, the excitement's there, but it's still going to take a lot of work and a lot of time and a lot of money, and that's why we have to continue supporting research. Well, yes. Now, <clears throat> Jill, I wonder if you would just tell us why you care about this personally. You've been there for a while now. Uh, clearly, you're a bright, super well-educated, capable person. You could be doing a lot of different things. Why, why spend your time on cancer research? Well, I, I, you know, I, I was always interested in science uh, from the time I was, you know, back in grammar school, really, and I and I always wanted to to be a scientist in the laboratory. But I never wanted to do science just for science' sake. I really was more interested in what you could do in a disease setting. And then when I was in graduate school, my mother uh, was diagnosed with ovarian cancer, and I watched my mother, you know, firsthand go through, you know, 10, 12 years of of, of you know battling the disease. And uh, it really brings, you know, as everyone everyone has this type of story, but it brings you really, you know, closer to it. And that was convinced me that I wasn't just going to be doing any disease that I answer. And then, of course, I always thought I'd be in the laboratory, uh, but and I was actually supported by the Cancer Research Institute when I was a postdoc at Rockefeller University. But you know, I I came over when an opportunity came to come to CRI, and I think that I can have I'm having. I think much broader impact than I could as a single researcher and it's been remarkable to work with the the caliber of scientists that we support throughout the world the people that are the scientific advisory council that advises us and selects what research we should use our philanthropic dollars for and I think you know it's it, it now as, as as CEO a part of my job is raising the funds but it's easy to raise funds for some for an organization you really believe in that's doing great work and getting remarkable responses for something that impacts so many people. So uh, you know, it's it's been an easy choice. It's been a path that kind of has happened organically for me. But uh, I I don't regret any decision I've made along the way. And uh, it's it's I'm so gratified to see the results we're getting now. I wasn't sure we would see this in my lifetime or in my career, but being able to say and see the results that are impacting cancer patients and that what I have done and what this Cancer Research Institute has done for so many years has led to this, it, it, there couldn't be, I don't think you could do anything else that's more gratifying it, it for anyone. Uh, that's, uh, that's a great uh, answer to that question. Now, I, I, I want to follow up. You talked about the fact that you feel like you're having great impact there, and and that's certainly true. We can see that in your work, but I wonder if you would just extrapolate for us and just give us, uh, from your experience, some advice that we could all use in order to increase our impact in the world for good. 
Well, I mean, I, I think obviously, you know, if, if you know you're doing something good and you have a good message or a good mission, you, you need to get it out to people so that people are aware so that they can understand what you're doing and be part of it. So I think it's uh, obviously in this era of social media, it's important to get out there uh, to the influencers, but whether they be reporters or individual people, that can help you uh, spread your message and, and get it to as many people as possible because, you know, running an, a, a not-for-profit organization, it, we rely totally on the goodness of other people uh, that are philanthropically supporting us. So for them to do that, you need to connect to them. They have to feel passionate about the mission of whatever organization is. And then m once people hear it and become passionate, I think the majority of people in this world are people that want to do good and have an impact. And so I think once they hear the story, it's hard not to, to get behind it. So I think that's that's extremely important. No, I, I hear that. That's, what, what a great message. And of course, for a media guy, it's a great, great answer. One last question here before we go. Who do you admire? Who do you look to as a role model, and why? Well, I, you know, I, I, you, you had posed this question to me yesterday uh, in prep, and I was thinking all night long of who I would say. And I think the person that I really admire is a person called Chuck Feeney. I don't know if you know Chuck Feeney. Chuck Feeney was a, a co-founder of Duty Free Shops, and uh, he's a billion. He was a billionaire, but he gave most of his wealth to a foundation called the Atlantic Philanthropies. And he has uh, given away more than, I think, $6 billion of his wealth to not-for-profit and charity to, to do good. And so here's a man that, if you read his bio, and I've, gotten, I've been lucky enough to meet him and know him personally. He's been a big supporter of the Cancer Research Institute. Uh, an unassuming man that uh, was an entrepreneur, I think, saw a need and, and a doer and created duty-free shops back in the 60s and uh, obviously was very successful and made a lot of money, but I think he always said, you know, money, it was not, he wasn't driven by doing money, he was driven to do hard work and then he really felt that everyone with wealth should really give back and do something good. So I think meeting someone like him, uh, it, it almost takes your breath away when you meet him personally as, a, as, a, as an unassuming man that has done so much good across the world. And I think, I don't know if there could be any other better role model from someone that is smart, savvy, businessman, entrepreneur, takes risks, and then does good. Uh, I, I think if, if, if I could look back on my life and do that, I, I think I'd be pretty happy. Well, that's a great answer, and uh, I, I'm glad to hear Chuck's story because I wasn't familiar with him. <clears throat> Before we go, how do people learn more about your research. I know there will be a lot of people who want to learn more. There are going to be want people who want to make donations. How do people get that kind of additional information? How do they help you in, in what you're doing? Well, probably the easiest way is to go to our website, uh, cancerresearch.org. Uh, you're also welcome to, to contact me directly, jtormey at cancerresearch.org. Uh, and, you know, we have an awful lot of information on our website. Uh, a website, uh, it's, it's information, there's scientific information, there's cancer information. We also have another website that we just launched in the last year called The Answer to Cancer, which is really dedicated to cancer patients and their caregivers. And in the, on that, there's Amazing stories. We, we launched this with 30 stories of P patients that have been successfully treated with cancer immunotherapy so that other patients could learn about what immunotherapy is because not everyone, it's not your standard, uh, you know, I think, factoid that most people know what cancer immunology or cancer immunotherapy is. And so this is so patients and caregivers can learn about this directly. There's a, also a clinical trial finder on there so patients can actually look to see if they're looking to see if they qualify for a, a clinical trial of a cancer immunotherapy. So I think those are probably three ways to get in touch with us and learn, but our website is a great source of information. Fantastic. Uh, Jill, we just couldn't, uh, can't thank you enough, can't thank you too much certainly. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today and, and for sharing your message with us. It's really a joy, and we certainly wish you every success. We're, we're, we're pulling for you. We're praying for you. We want you to be successful in this work. Well, thank you very much, and I really appreciate you helping us get the word out about the field of cancer immunotherapy and about the Cancer Research Institute. So thank you very much. All righty. Let's do some good.